Hey there, everybody. This is Dr. T, friend of God by his mercy and friend of the Christian leader and anybody else, whether you're a denominational, legalistic or not, black, brown or white. And if you're not a Christian, I'll be your friend because I am impressed strongly by people who are really passionate about their cause, their faith, because they're not afraid. They're not lukewarm, dull down. And that's what the Bible says in Revelation 15, 16, something like that. The Bible said, or 3, 15, it says that the God rebuked, Father God, leader God rebuked the Christian minister who was lukewarm. He said, either to the whole church, either be hot or cold, or I'll spew you out of my mouth. And so when I was in DFW in the deep Southwest for a really long time, I came across a lot of the tepid, lukewarm, and they were, I hate to say it, a lot of them were haughty. And they just had no empathy or compassion. They were very weary because of all their good labors and achievements. So it made me realize, what is God wanting now in ministry? What is he saying? Because this is a great time for prayer, for loving people, showing God's real respect, giving God the first, you know, due diligence to show off his love. Because, you know, even to be honest, with all the pressure and the weirdness of the world, we don't know how long we're going to be here. In the middle of June, I got a word from the Lord and it said, just a message came to me to give. It said, we're in the last inning. This is the last inning and the last will be first and the first will be last. Talking to the Christian, to the church. And when I realized the word inning, this is the last inning, I remembered how one of my children played softball in fifth grade. And I remember softball had the longest innings and the longest games. There were 26 innings that were slow innings. So I'm not saying we got to, you know, there's this immediate instant but we don't want to miss it by being too late and being passionate, more passionate, fervent in a genteel, gentle fashion, respectful, non-biased fashion to show the heart of God that we really care. I believe if anything that has come to my heart in the last 20 years, 25, 30 years, it's the lack of love, the lack of fun in ministry. It's gotten to be there are all these games, especially in the I hate to say it, tongue talkers, that I moved myself out of. God removed me out of being a charismatic in 2012 because there were too many false teachings and also no love, and they were hard. And then all this, I call it almost playtime. Many of them in the grassroots were, I guess, without fathers that were respectful or just didn't know how to behave or, you know, in real life, men and women. So the idea is I realize this is what we have in our nation that in many that are ruining the cause of Christ unless we're more careful not to be biased, racist, disrespectful. My Bible teaches me there's a prayer. It says beseech the Lord. We are to beseech the Lord of the harvest to send laborers across their paths. All right. Sometimes you're the laborer. Sometimes you're not. But we need many people praying for the Lord of the harvest, the good God, to send laborers across people's paths. But what is a laborer? This is the point. A laborer is not a legalist who fusses, is a bigot, quotes the Bible, but demeans them by disrespecting, acts superior and haughty and avoids people because they're too, you don't want to be tainted. <clears throat> what a laborer is, is a genuine, authentic, real person who just loves and respects people. You respect them first. That is the labor has to respect first. You don't teach until you respect. That's what I've learned. So from our ministry in the last 25 years and getting in, especially Dallas, <clears throat> in the charismatic spirit field, because I was growing, I need the Holy Spirit because I love him. And I also enjoy the therapeutic worship, long worship. But that didn't mean you can go there very often if you find flaky stuff and flaky ministry in the bathwaters that have that and not all do but not all don't so it made me pull back when I was out there and I got from the Lord about we need, we don't need more how to do it to quote the Bible right now that's everywhere we don't need to do it how to stand and claim and proclaim for finances 
You're always going to need finances. Some of that, sure you will, but we don't need to know about how to get into the, you know, the Oracle office. We need relationship teaching. How <laughs> to show respect, E-O-R-R, -R, equal opportunity, real respect for the office of every human made in God's image. One of the biggest witnesses about what we see in real life in certain places, especially metroplexes, is the confusion, the massive confusion and cynicism, even being afraid of or thinking you're going to be there bias, is the bias now against Christians, the cynicism. Why? I know why. They were disrespected. <laughs> they were demeaned. And there's tons of people. When I have been in ministry for longer than many people have been alive, a generation in this call to study his body since 24, when I was 24, and then all the moves of God happened, TV and black and white and, you know, famous people we know now, I still have, because of the timing when God placed me to be born on this earth and have ministry, I would still remember the quality of just being normal, natural, not famous, relating to people, showing you care. My father, the pastor, up with the Lord, never famous, never a backbiter, never an ego, always just amiable, patient, and a genuine article on and off any stage. And he wasn't a fabulous speaker. I know that. He was a great husband. A great dad. He was a person who didn't believe, even though because he'd been to seminary, the Baptist seminary, he didn't believe in speaking in tongues or mir you know the miracles of Acts. He didn't believe for the book of Acts because he was trained that they stopped back then, which we know it is, you know. But his love is to me what was deposited, his kindness, and watching him as he went about like Jesus in Acts 10, 38, just unsung. Nobody knows he's doing it, but his daughter was there. And he was white, but he was relating to black and white, old and young, females and males. He never act time pressured. He never act, you know, proud or on my way, I'm too important to relate so I would remember one of my pictures I keep getting is he's in the grocery store in line paying for the groceries. I was with him. And one of the ladies at the cash register starts to tell him all her woes and her problems. And my father just being patient and respectful, equal opportunity, real respectful, a gentleman, a genuine article. He listened and he really cared. I think of Christ. A lot of people are so biased, I've met in ministry, it's just so tragic, demeaning the newbie or the, because they're tough or hard or never got taught respect. And so you go in there and there's certain groups that are very stoic and they're hard, they're not kind. They think they are, but they have this way, it's like they're too emotional. It means they're superior, they're proud. You know, God made people of all spectrums of personality. There's a Myers-Briggs test they give you in a corporation that tells you everyone has a valid personality. Some have been through hell, some have not. Some are more, you know, could have mentally diseased or not. Some are full of themselves or not. But God can put people that test you and me by putting somebody that is our opposite nature to see how we react, how my heart reacts, your heart. And it happens all the time. There's a scripture for that. To see if we'll accuse them, be superior, need to be over them. All right. There's a scripture for that. It says God uses the foolish things of the world sometimes to confound the worldly wise in us. Really. So he could put, if you are, if he knows, see God is watching. If he knows you're really a secret bigot, a secret class conscious, proud, he will send you somebody the opposite that's making no income. That is black or brown, or maybe if you're a black person that prejudice, a white person. A certain style. It's the styles within the groups that's really it. So when you show up in your earth suit or your tradition or your lack thereof or your outfit or your personality, your energy, your vibe, it is 
radiates and the other person perceives it. And if they're dysfunctional, their heart will label them and accuse them. Similar to Eli Templeay Priesthood, the aged Eli experienced minister, who when he saw a lone woman, which was Hannah, the future mother, he didn't know it, the future mother of the first prophet of the nation of Israel, but it looked like just same, you know, one of the typical women of the day on the front porch of the temple during his break, and she was grieving. The Bible said she was grieving because she was persecuted. She was the favorite wife of two wives of her husband, Elkanah, but she was persecuted because she was barren. The other wife was rubbing her nose in it. So she went to the temple in her grief to go before the Lord. Well, here's the old priest, Eli, the user misogynist because of he tolerated his sons, the associate ministers. First cha- chapter of Samuel, first four chapters of Samuel, one chap of first Samuel, excuse me. And so he tolerated because the, the two sons Sons of the devil, were their nickname, were well known throughout the area that they slept with the women and used the women that came to the temple. These were office ministers. And that the sons put pressure on people to give them the offering which they consumed for themselves. So Eli was tolerating it. We don't know if he's afraid of being controlled by his sons. You know, he didn't want to make them behave. I don't know. But because they didn't respect females or set them straight, the two sons, and then he accused the strange woman from afar, it tells us a red flag that this kind of minister is biased, misogynist, no compassion, and a lover of themselves, selfish. So Hannah comes up. As a test case on the front porch of the Eli Temple High Priesthood. And she is not known by him. He doesn't know who she is. She, he doesn't know what's wrong. But it tells. We know in First Samuel that she is weeping and grieving. Her heart is breaking. All right. He sees formula. He sees baggage. Oh my. One more overly emotional female. Oh my gosh, she's going to take my time, wear me out. Always complaining. She's drunk. So what happens is the test case of Hannah appears. It red flags his heart, which is not pure. And it's blaming, accusing a stranger instead of rising up in ministry and going over to find out what's wrong with her to help her. He doesn't do that. Later he changes and then prophesies, and she does become the mother of Samuel. But we learn this about gender jaundice in ministry and also of not setting the office ministers straight with their character. They're not pure-hearted. And see, when I was sent about by the Lord I would to go to conferences from 24 on, I would invite many people to go with me. And if it were a conference, they'd always say, oh, we're too busy we're too tired. We can't afford it. And I just go to be with the Lord. And I thought, this is my little time with the Lord. And I would go. And so I was like a Hannah, not knowing it for many years, but I would trigger only one thing that ever got my attention was whelp. And that to me is why I've studied it. Cause I thought, man, God said, if I see anything that hurts people or accuses them and is dishonest or anything, not just that anything that hurts Jesus' name or the people who want to fellowship three times or more, I'm to teach on it and confront it. So I do. So we want to picture the office of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the prophet, the head of the movement, the founder, like Acts 10, 28, 1038. Jesus went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. We know he related, he went about. He wasn't stuck in his aura, his cave, or whatever. He did good. He healed. He, did, he had, you know, anointing. He healed all those who were oppressed by the devil, but he didn't oppress with dogma, his style, his 
manipulation or legalism or authority, you know, ego, he didn't oppress, suppress, or withstand anybody. He was relationship holy and pure before the Lord. So we have to teach now and confront. You know, I'd rather be anywhere than having to do this by now. I've been around the United States, many pockets, many revivals, many movements as the Lord had led me and wanted me to know about. I've been to Florida, North Carolina, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Missouri. I've been a lot of places, deep south. Pennsylvania was as far up as I was sent because it's mostly deep south, which I now know can say is the Bible Belt, basically, not all. And if this is the Bible Belt, back in the deep south of Dallas, my nightmare, I wrote a little, you know, I'd get these funny phrases. It was so stressful to be there, frankly, in ministry. I like Texas. I really like Texas. I like Dallas. I like the big thinking, the blue sky. I like the, you know, people think big. But it was trying to find fellowship. Christians, that was the nightmare. So one day I got a scripture. for. I started getting on Twitter in 2012 and since been online a lot. Um, and the, it was, you. if you want to say you're the Bible belt, you got to change the plastic buckle. If you're going to say that you represent the Bible Belt, Christian, you got to change that plastic buckle. Think about it in different levels. It really is that way. So when we reprove, it's abnormal. Nobody wants it. Nobody supports it, <laughs> you know, really. So this is a, you know, just doing what God says. That's what needs to be done. The prophet, like Jeremiah, was not popular. The Lord said, don't be afraid of their faces. And it's taken me a long time to get accustomed. And I know the joy. I know family. I'm a real stable person because I was raised healthy. I'm very reliant on the Lord. And when I can find the right people, I'm sent the right people. I hang out and have a good time. I have a great fun side. I really do. At this point in my life, after I've been seen too much, especially Dallas... I cannot stop confronting this as long as it keeps showing up if I go visit a ministry. If I, if it, I cannot rest and say, oh, America's going to be okay because the church has repented because they haven't. Wouldn't it be weird if it was the famous preachers and their cults that they've grown and their systems and their legalism and their permission and their morality that was blocking the whole nation and blocking God from being able to send those revival and the harvest. What if, what if the nation is hanging on a thread from perishing forever because egos, various egos are enthroned in their own shell, self-preserving their cult while America goes down to ruin. When I've studied, been ostracized, by the mean spirit they don't know they project it but I'm a prophet seer it is hard to miss it is Psalm 123 so God has given me scripture to support this because when I go he said don't take it don't take it personally take it as a prophet if you see it three times or more so what I'm saying is prophetic because he said if you see it three times or more I'm letting you know, allowing you to know how I see much more of it. It is hurting my cause. It is hurting people. It is disrupting the move of God. So therefore I do it. One of the things I've noticed about many kinds of Christians, I teach and train. This is cross body unity. That's our kind, our style, our brand, whatever you say. Ephesians 4, cross body unity. I choose when I relate and speak or address any kind of Christian at all, real trust in black or white. I think I'm teaching you as part of the community or I'm just relating to you or having fun with you that day. I'm just being with, I'm fellowshipping with the saints as the, in the organic sense. I don't have to know your pedigree. I don't have to have you with a pedigree or, or whatever. I don't care if you speak in tongues. I don't care if you don't speak in tongues. One of the things I've found through the years, the thread that has been lost in a lot of this charismatica is servant leadership. If I deal with Catholics, man, my heart is just impressed 
servant leadership, down to earth, low key, not putting on airs, filled with faith. Man, it's shockingly helpful and wonderful to remind certain kinds of ministers are like that. There can be some, a few, but I think it's very hard to capture that now due to TV, mega, and then the packaging and the need, like the peer pressure that all this is putting on the normal, that used to be a normal kind of Christian and leadership because of the day in which we live, there's an expectation of being professional. And I've had that, you know, try to be professional. But when I've seen so much chaos in Christianity in the relationships, criticism, fault finding, needless, friendly fire fellowships everywhere that are certain kinds, it made me really want to be the opposite. I really thought, I'm just going to, because, a principle. Back when TV first got on, remember the females, the two females that big, you know, TV ministers, they're all gone with the Lord. They were all this makeup and big hair, big makeup. And everybody was tempted. I was not to make fun of them. I was not by God's grace. All I thought was I looked at their backstory. This is how I do it. I looked at both of those two famous Christian TV on ladies with big hair and big makeup, big makeup. And I thought, let me see their backstory. So realized that both of them were raised stark raven Pentecostal with no makeup and no fun, practically no food. They were poor. So when they got elevated and they had money, they went for it. That's what I thought. Back in Virginia when this started, I would watch TV and it was a great thing to see some Christian TV. It was, you know, well done. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't prom promote or go after everything, but it, once in a while it was fine. However, I thought, because I heard people laughing, I thought of God's grace. I thought of the scripture, God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the worldly wise. Even Apostle Paul that I'm teaching on now, Apostle Paul referred to himself as the off-scouring dung of the world. When I picture myself and my call as an apostle, like Paul's chapter, Galatians 1, 1 and 2, I picture it the same way. I'm just an off-scouring apostle. And that's fine. I've been around. I've had a lot of things, Pauline shipwrecks and siftings and recurring horrendous things. But, you know, God is there because I'm here for the word of the Lord and minister. So when I've been sent... My worst personal nightmare, if I'm sent, I can speak, I can help them, I can pray. You know, I'm a friend to all kinds. I don't care if you speak in tongues, but if I'm sent as an apostle, as a sent messenger, there must be a reason. All I learned from this is that now I know you can be sent, but you, that didn't mean you're going to be respected or received. And that's part of the apostle turf too, so you move on. It just helps me get to know the turf and help other people that have been in this thing and notice the fruit of relationships and no fear of the Lord. So when I was sent time after time to mega ministry TV famous, where I'd find whelp and it was like, whoa, typecasted their worst nightmare. The Jez, you know, all this stuff that goes on. That's plastic cares is why I quit charismatic and not because of them personally, because the spirit was around America I don't want to be associated in that. I don't want to, because see, they also are entitled. And if I walk in and not famous, they presume and they project that I'm there to be under them. And that's false. No, they don't, are not used to many of these people. All people really are not used to a female being a, like this office, a chief apostle, all five offices. So that's why I'm instructing, because I really feel that Galatians 1, 1 and 2, after all we're seeing in ministry, that's not all true is the future. The future church has got to be watchful who they allow to speak into their life, who they're under, who they're in relationship. It is that big and tragic, too tragic in this day. So I'm going to, I'm pre, you know, like a prototype. I hope this is a prototype. Uh, when I was having a hard time because I was raised free, I wasn't raised primitive. I was raised loved. But when I was still raised not under the law that I could do whatever God says. 
and that I'm available to be a servant, and I'd meet this bias and this legalism and this suspicion and accusation against a strong female, a white female from white people, it made me shut down because I thought maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I am in error. But when I studied it and studied their doctrine, studied their lifestyle, studied their way of relating to people and respecting, I realized they were biased. Many of these are biased against all colors as well. So it isn't against them personally, but I'm an office minister. I need to confront it because this is a new day and it's not their day. We hope, we can hope they make it into the new move, the future church. We can hope. But without love, without equal opportunity, real respect for everybody, without making, you know, see, I think it's funny. Not really funny because it was painful. I didn't know I'd be a divorced person. I didn't know I'd be a divorced minister. I was forced. It was an, you want scripture? Malachi 2, all just like that. It was the choice I was not given to have counsel, prayer, or anything. It was not, it was a Bible divorce. The other part of, besides Malachi 2, was 1 Corinthians 7.15. It says, if the unbeliever wants to go, you have to let him. And that is not fun. It's a lot of pain. Because I'm a caring person, and I'm willing to give it my all no matter and forgive. I really am. But like I've learned, you are not anybody's parent. You are not responsible. You cannot change them. It's challenging, but they ultimately are accountable for the Lord, and I'm accountable. So mine is to forgive and be ready to do whatever. But I didn't know I'd be sent out to Dallas. Whoa, respecter of person central in the charismatic sense, I didn't know it'd be sent out as everybody's typecast for the most accusing legalism you could come up with in a Christian charismatic sense. I, and that's all right, I embrace it for the sake of the gospel because God is just showing me and teaching me what goes on in his name and how there's so much honoring of all these false honoring when they don't even respect the people God sends them. They don't even like them. They don't even want them. They're used to having it their way. It's a scare, and they're cults now. Famous follower, and I'm the alf scouring apostle that was sent to teach them, to warn them, to mature them, to make them even keel so they're not hurting God's people. You know, many times the prophet, the pastor, all the offices, the angel unaware, the mother, the person of black skin, the secret agent God sends to test them. It will be a test for me or you, but God is testing them to think, are they, how are the preachers acting? Because they're in charge, you know, they're supposed to be like, as the church goes, so goes our nation. And you can see how our nation is not going very well at all. So I'm there to be their worst nightmare and to stir them up by provoking their teaching to be, you know, analyzed and Honor the good parts. Oh, yeah, I can find good parts, great parts in some of these. But what does it say in 1 Corinthians, which is Paul? Even if I speak with the tongues of angels and have not love, I am nothing. So I've been a dung apostle, and I'm more comfortable with that. I'd rather be out in the grassroots, middle income. I'd rather be with real people. I can fellowship, which I do, where it's healthy doctrine, respectful for every kind of person. I do respect, but because my mission is not finished. My mission is to the church. The church is the body of Christ to be ready to preparing the bride of Christ, not the pride of Christ, not the snide one upmanship pride of Christ. It's about the Lord, not me, not them. It's about the Lord. Who are we allowing ourselves to follow and model? and demonstrate by our love or lack thereof. Who are we? It's a quagmire and people are slipping between the cracks in major, major mega numbers. Not knowing who Jesus is, not wanting him, not wanting to know about him because of all the famous faces and all the pride and all the religious. So I'd rather, I really felt like being online, my being online since 2015 was a sign an unsettling sign. I didn't know COVID would happen. But I felt like the numbers I got, all I could do is think of the grassroots and how they're trapped 
by religion. They're trapped with people who are dysfunctional ministers or leaders in the local area who watch everybody, you know, accuse them for being unsubmitted, great and small. They can't find anybody who's just loving and natural and then have this a secret agenda be own them, to be over them and own them. Part of the, I think my worst taste for charismatics is the game playing, mind game playing, the mischievous mind game playing of who's over who. Keeping watch on anybody else that's shepherding Western European Levitical patriarchism with a little bit extra in there. So I don't play. I'm, that's what drove me. It drives me to study the Bible and be a noble Berean even more. I would not. I want to thank them. Let's see. I had this thank you note. I was going to do this in my office, but let's see if I can find it. I thought of Jimmy Sw Jimmy Fallon, and at times I'll Google his parts where he's doing thank you notes on YouTube and watch those. They're pretty clean. And so when I found some thank you notes in my office the other day, I was going to film. Let's see if I can pull it out. If I have it with me here on the road. Here it is. And I was going to say, thank you, charismatic. Thank you. Thank you, Baptist. Let's thank the Baptist first. Thank you, Baptist. Thank you for making me really realize what important to really keep the Lord first. Be equal opportunity, real respectful to everybody. To not be name-calling and jumping people in public or aristocratic and proud. I thank you. Thank you for keeping the core focus of the gospel. Whether you speak in tongues or not, thank you. You're very respectful and mature in your authority. It's not legalistic or patriarch, you know, patriarchal do much. So thank you. So now let's go to the next group. <laughs> so I want to say thank you. Thank you, charismatic. <laughs> thank you, plastic, charismatic, sin spying and regal. <laughs> thank you for making me realize there's more to life than following that false teaching. Thank you. There's more to life than following under teaching you don't that you realize is not in the Bible. I want to thank you for helping me, encourage me to stir up my teaching gift and stir up my boldness to confront and to read between the lines of what is true and true is false by being a noble Berean that I hope is going to make Paul proud in some fashion. Thank you. And thank you for your offices, the good stuff you do, the really good stuff. But right now, that's not cut and mustard for the new move of God. You got to have respect. You got to have office respect, staff respect, team respect, non-biased. And I'm going to help you, hopefully, being your friend, faithful are the wounds of a friend, Proverbs 26, 27, 6, by reproving and correcting, which is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, because we want to have your good stuff and you, many of you, stay on in this new move. Back in May, I had gotten a word of the Lord, and it was for the body. It said, God's, let's see, every move of God is a rough draft of the next move. It's just a rough draft before the next move. So I realized the 80s move, 90s move, whatever we're in now, is a rough draft for next, which is the future church, or, you know, whatever's going to happen. Could be Jesus comes, we don't know. But we want to act. See, this is it. God has a way of refining us, reproving us, by saying we're not the only, we're not the big shots, we we haven't arrived. Back in the 80s, when all these moves started, I was sent out, and I was visiting different kinds, studying the charismatic a lot, got in the prophetic in the 90s. Then I noticed this big eye thing coming on the scene, and I wasn't comfortable with it because I'd never thank God for Baptists and Catholics like that, different kinds. You know, even Methodists, different vineyard type things and I know the difference so I was thinking man what is this entitled or whatever it got worse it got worse and worse and now it's like <sighs> covens and cults certain groups and they don't know they do it they have no clue they're all self involved see once you sit under somebody and you don't mix around it makes you unstable 
because you are only in your own. You can only you filter everything and everybody through only one kind of teaching or one kind of development of your style, and that's not healthy. That's anti community Ephesians four. So excuse me when I um <laughs> when I got misty when I was doing my thank you notes, it got my makeup running, which I think is funny because I'm out here in the heat for a few more minutes. Okay. Um, so we want to run up our joy factor in ministry. That's, if anything, I think, let's make, let's go back to the organic Bible and notice that Jesus Christ was sent for all people. And we study him in his relationships, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how he acted and reacted in every relationship that was mentioned in ministry with his family with Mary and everybody the fallen women the Pharisees whomever and then all we do is act like Jesus that's it we want to make Jesus more fun as a prophet when you look and you read about Jesus the mega global minister of all kinds and styles and ages we notice in Hebrews 1 and 2, there's a difference between the Old Testament representation of the prophet and Jesus. It says, in these days, Hebrews 1, chapter 2, God speaks to us through his son. In the old days, Old Testament, God spoke to us through diverse manners with the prophets. Now he speaks to us through his son. Therefore, we got to act and react and paint a picture in ministry of Jesus, even with his mom even with time off with the little children. we got to do it, and that's what's going to win people and bring people to him. Next, when I look at Hebrews 1.9, it's a missing factor. Nobody knows this. Nobody seems to understand it. Jesus, the office prophet, the apostle, the global minister of all times, of this faith, had joy. It said in chapter 1 of Hebrews, Paul's writings, that Jesus had the oil of joy and gladness above his fellows. That means his countenance, his joy was immense. It was maybe a silent joy, maybe it was a merry joy, a mirthful joy, a happy practice, you know, happy camper joy. We don't know. Jesus Christ, the prophet, the true prophet, had the oil of joy. God anointed Jesus Christ, his son, with the oil of joy and gladness above his fellows. One, that means God likes joy. God has some joy. <laughs> Father God, the creator, is joy. He made you, didn't he? <laughs> All right. So it says there are two reasons why and how Jesus had that joy. Hebrews 1, 9. It says Jesus, the minister, the Christ. All right. He said... He hated iniquity. That's the sin condition, the heart condition. That's why he died and you know paid the price to be our Savior. Because the power of sin and death and addiction and pain and anger and all these things is so big, it took a supernatural displacement by the resurrected power and the Holy Spirit. Okay, being saved. And inviting Jesus into your heart gives you deposit of the Holy Spirit, which are the fruit of the Spirit, and you can get more power and study his Bible and get fellowship locally. You know, all these things. So it said, because Jesus hated iniquity and he loved what was righteous, God anointed him, Jesus, with the oil of joy and gladness above his fellows. Wow. Who'd have thought? Jesus didn't hate the sinner with iniquity. He came, loved him. He wasn't superior or self-righteous because he was holy. He just had the holy fear of the Lord and a pure heart. That's it. So our goal is to really revamp and really go through as a scholar, as a natural person, as a human being, a female or male. We want to go through and see who in the world is the real organic Jesus. Let us value what he valued. Let us put our priorities where they really need to be, and they're not now. We can't get people to come to church many places. Even after the churches is open last week or two, it's been in the that 25% of people are coming back. The rest haven't. And I, from where I go, it looks like they're all back. Most of, A lot of them are back, but that's nationally. Before COVID, I'd seen too much. From the 80, from the 90s, really 2000s on, about the late 90s on, I'd seen all this criticism of the people and gossip, 
and uh, backbiting in ministry. It was just atrocious, having been raised the opposite in ministry, professional ministry, all my life. So I started to pick apart what kind of groups study their doctrinal beliefs and what kind and styles they were, and that's where I found all these whelp teachings. And I'm not sure, but maybe those people, you know, people that were raised rough or poor, then got a title, and they never got healed or they never repented. And maybe we got a lot of chaos, you know, because of TV. Back in the 90s or the before that, I remember when it became the thing to get your 5013C. At one point, and see, I had my 5013C. I put it down as a sign of God's protest in 2012 when I just got, God led me from being a charismatic. All right, it's a silent protest, a prophetic act. So we went, we had been around in many, 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 many meetings with pastors. I was invited all the time. Behind the scenes, you would hear things you didn't care to hear, but you know, some things were, most of it was really healthy. A lot of, a lot of it was really healthy and loving, but I'm saying I'd never heard things like the word church hopper. I'd never seen people assaulting somebody because they thought they never talked to them up front. They ne never went over to respect them, to find out or honor them as a fellow human. They jumped them and accused them of being in rebellion. <laughs> wow, that's called the flesh. So when these things got my attention, startled me, because they were not Baptist. These were not black. Black people don't do this. I could only feel for God. I could only feel for their souls I could, because it's lawless and unrepentant. I could only feel for their people, because when I would go there and in that group that does this, the people were, ne they're always like soulish and self absorbed and, you know, poor me and, and not really joyful. And see, I am joyful. Maybe that's why I stir up whelp, because I am pretty joyful. And I have a really a comedic side. I can get, I can get going and laugh and be hilarious. And I'd like to be able to do that more now, but they won't let me. This spirit is relentless. This big spirit, the misogynist, intrusive, and seerish spirit, the, the I don't know, it is a spirit. The reason I say it's a spirit, because I'm a seer prophet, and you can feel that hook. I've had people, and see, nothing spooks me when I say this. Do not get spooked. I do not feel spooked about them. I do not feel spooked about ministry. I don't feel spooked about people who pray against me. I know the feeling, though. I've had people, I've had real people pray against me, cause me trouble. But then I realized these Christians are in the occult, and I'm going to bind it because it's a controlling spirit. I'm going to bind it, put the blood of Jesus over it, and send it back to them that send it to me. That's what I do. So I'm not worried about it. It moves on. I can feel little pinchers, something trying to seize my heart. I can try many things. I have weird stuff that goes on. But because I'm a human being and a natural person, it doesn't bother me. I'm no wuss. <laughs> but I feel that this is just one more sign of great false teaching and entitlement and great lack of love and oh, no holy fear of the Lord and false teaching. It is privileged. If you do that, you're controlling, you're using witchcraft as a Christian. That is false. Why do I say that? Second Samuel, first or second Samuel fifteen twenty three says in my Bible, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is as the sin of iniquity and idolatry. I've had, the reason I quit being a charismatic and the reason I quit up here, a lot of the places I go recently, too much witchcraft. It is witchcraft. Not being straightforward, ducking and avoiding, manipulating and posturing, sins, you know, using their seer gifts to span, scan you and scan you and have many people scan you. It is so disturbed. It is so disgusting. It is so proud and childlike and so non-Bible. Jesus would not do that. It is an abusive thing. It is abusive to accuse people 
and witch watch and never talk to them. That is the elite subculture in a lot of medica famous ministries right now. And they think they're blind. It's They call evil good, good evil, Isaiah 5.20, because if you're sitting there pure-hearted, no sin in your life, you've been in Christian ministry a long time, and they can't even discern an Elijah from a Jezebel, a witch, what have we got? What are they off in in other places, maybe many other places in their ministry? Why would I, why would I want to be violated? And, dis, you know, it's very disturbing. This is not just one place. These are many places in the same kind of whelp movement. This is the whelp disturbing side of office whelp. It is now entitled. It is now occult. It is now got, I guess we've arrived. We're in one of nothing. When I was in DFW, my hardest group was, I was in North Dallas in many places. And my hardest group were the Christians, the red state white culture of born again, Bible pumping Christians, always busy, always wanting to make money, all this stuff, materialism. And I thought, there for the grace of God go I. But I thought, man, that's a, I didn't realize the culture was that massive because it is a massive place in the Metroplex. God let me see how powerful that is in a negative fashion for our nation. And that many of these people, some of these people aren't going to make it. That's why I started getting stronger. And one reason, another reason is, because I've been pretty quiet, and I think it for years. I've always thought it, and I've never shrunk back. But to be this bold and really go forward when you know they're going to all get so upset is because it's the non-Christian. We want to let Jesus, people know who Jesus is so they'll be saved. They've had their time. You've had your time. You got your money. All right? Doesn't matter. So when I was finding myself like frozen out, witch watch, never spoken to, refused to have relationships, no fear of the Lord, no humility, I just went to the Bible and went to the Barista Fellowship, started online, started meeting people to buy a divine appointment, which is better. So I'd met a couple that was a black pastor and his wife. Very nice. They were planning a church somewhere close by. And so one day they called me up. And the wife had had a dream for me. This was right before I left. And they said, Tevo, my wife had a dream we want to meet. So we met at the Barista Fellowship. And they said, the dream was to have, oh, God wants you to be bolder. And I'd felt that. I thought, what's wrong, Lord? Something isn't right. And I'd felt like, I need to be bolder about this. I thought, all right. Well, God knew I needed the confirmation. So he sent this couple, and the very nice, smart couple. And the wife said, to have, oh, God said for you to be bolder. And I have ever since. They also mentioned it was the toughest they were trying to plant a church in the same sort of wealthy area. And he said, we have never had it so hard to get a church planted before. The reason? The whole group out there is we're, we are, we're in need of nothing. We have it all. We're in need of nothing. And I thought, that's what I was picking up. That's the, my worst nightmare. When you bump into the compassion fatigued Eli, the misogynist, the entitled, the, that call himself a Christian minister, prophetic, you know, pastor, whatever, blame shifting, immune, no compassion, look down on you. I went, wow, I guess that's what I was sent to see on behalf of our nation, on behalf of them for repentance, real revival. So my plan is not to accuse, but I've I've been used to speak about doctrine. What does it say in Isaiah? Isaiah, to me, Isaiah is the book for right now. And Ephesians, those two books are the mega books. Chock full of everything God's anointing in for these days. And so when you look at the Bible, it has two scriptures about doctrine in the book of Isaiah. Google doctrine. The first one's Isaiah it says, well, I'll do Isaiah 28 first. It says, those 
who erred in spirit shall come to understanding. Those who murmured shall learn doctrine. Another example, another translation said, those that murmured shall learn the truth. Well, that means they're not learning the true doctrine in Christian circles and ministry. And our nation is murmuring and bitter and reviling. They've never been taught good doctrine. The second verse about doctrine is when do you start to teach doctrine? That too is in the book of Isaiah. It says, when do we teach children doctrine? We teach them doctrine as soon as they're weaned from the breast. Google the word doctrine. So we have a lot of false teaching or omitted teaching or rationalized out of it. It's not going to get us any money or it's not fun or playtime. Now I can speak to... I've been through, uh, and I was, you know, one of the things I value is that the faith movement, God led me to the faith movement. My mother and sister introduced me to it when my dad died. And I was there before it got commercialized, before it got, you know, wacko and certain interpretations of the people who took it and abused it. And that has happened. And I don't really fellowship with the people at the grassroots anymore because of too much of this. But I really honor and I thank God. And let me get my thank you note out. Where's my thank you note? I put it somewhere. But anyway, my thank you note was to say, if I could find it, I'm very thankful for the word of faith. I am so thankful, word of faith. You've been a lifesaver. If I didn't know how to walk and not be moved by people, God's people, by pressure, by color, skin color, by what's in the checkbook, by whatever it is, by other moves of God. If I didn't know how to walk, that faith is not moved by what it sees, hears, thinks, or I would not have made it this far like this. And, and joy. Also knowing about the joy, they have a lot of real joy in the faith movement. There is not, to my attention, there's no occult in the faith movement. I don't believe, I think there's some, at the lower end, where they follow the famous preacher and teacher, there needs to be instruction in that group. Because they can be off and really making a mess of the name of the, <laughs> of the faith, you know. They're not organic, because they're really, the Bible teaches us, and it's not against people or anyone in the faith movement or anyone not. There is a principle that the Lord says in the Bible. God said in his word, at first, God gave the good news, the gospel, to the ignorant and untrained men. All right? But surely, this is my interpretation, he didn't want them, you or me, to stay that way. He didn't want it to stay playtime or just about me, my four, looking fancy, being over everybody. And see, that movement has gotten also mixed in with almost every kind of movement, especially the speaking in tongues crowd. So you're going to find perversions, a lot of perversions and using of that, abusing of the good principles. So I would say if you're interested, which I think we need more faith to teach it with these big circumstances, fearful things. I noticed how pitiful the Christians are right now in the last two or three years, how complainy, weak. And I thought, man, by God's grace, I happened to be put on the earth with great parenting, full of faith, but not of the faith movement. But I happened to learn at the grassroots trickle when it first started how to renew my mind, how to get myself positive. Praise and worship also is another big part that I honor and I want to thank them. A lot of people. Power and Praise by Marlon Crothers. Man, that changed my life. Power and Praise in the 70s or 80s. Man, that was a book. You can Google it now. You need to get it. If you have any depression or oppression in your thinking, feeling negative, get that and then turn on the YouTube worship. Man, so cool. So I have a lot of things I'm very grateful for. And all I want to do is be with the Lord and be myself. I want to just be myself. And if I happen to have a word of the Lord or two, I'll give it. If I want to go work out, take off. My biggest thing is not being controlled. I'm not a controller, but whenever I'm with those, well, those things, those people that are controlling, they, it's like good old boys. Automatically, I threaten them and they act like I intimidate them, I guess, or trigger them. 
and they start to want to micro, you know, control me. So I'm very careful who I fellowship with, who I hang around. I'm not a controller, and I will not be controlled. And if you need help not being controlled, I'm your person. <laughs> I'm your sister, because I can give you scripture. And the issue is, I believe in accountability. And I've always had boring and people that are accountable. I really have all my life until now. When I was so, not fearfully frightened, but so deeply disturbed about the false teaching so deeply disturbed and i couldn't trust in dallas i didn't know who to trust i didn't feel that i could trust many in the care in, that speak in tongues frankly right now because the false teaching and the need to own people slave drivers it really bothers me and i am not going to be put under false teaching about false authority that sin conscious that needs me to be submitted when they don't even submit to relationship Matthew eighteen fifteen Galatians one six six one about upfront confrontation. Instead it's a lie. A lot of it's a lie. They think because they read you, diagnosed you with their spooky spiritual gift they think they have, they presume to have no more, that now they know you, but they've never related. That's false teaching. And so they'll tell everybody they've warned you They've warned them. They have witch lists, all this stuff, because I've been around. God has taught me a lot of stuff to help people, to help the wealth be pure, to help the people that are being pursued and persecuted by them, the witch watchers, and to say, let's get a common doctrine. Let's get back to the even keel. So on my message of mentoring by Apostle Paul, I honor the faith movement. I honor the healthy groups. I honor the non-clubby. I really do. And within the whelp, I can honor a lot of your Holy Spirit ministry and your faith for that. But I will not take false, psychic, occult, dominating spirit of whelp, which is a Jezebel spirit that they are so, it's so funny. It's a familiar spirit. So if I'm around it, I have to be very careful because I've been bitten by it and suppressed. You know, I've been witch watch so much by false teaching that I'm highly can recognize it and I'm not I don't tolerate so I go when I go I go where I know it's not there and I can have joy I want Holy Spirit I really do I want diversity they're not diverse the whelp are not often diverse but I'm also now after this I thank the whelp I wish I could find my little my little thank you note to thank you what I want to thank you whelp because now I've got my doctorate I've got my teammate you.com coming up I earned three doctorates in Dallas alone due to this, due to all the disconcerting legalism and false religion in Dallas, charismatica, tongue speaking, the anti-relationship crowd. <laughs> I learned, earned three PhDs. Now I had a BA. Then I had an honorary music, sacred music in 2004 doctorate. But when I went to Dallas, I had three hard-earned degrees. The first one was Ph.D., Pile Pretty Hard Days. The second one was Ph.D., Piled High and Deep. And the last one was my DFW degree, Dallas Finest and Its Worst. And I will never be the same. I'll never look at Dallas the same way. I will never look at ministry the same way. And I will say, I will never want to be like some of that stuff. So we are for Dallas, the great part, but we are concerned. I'm concerned as a sister that some of those fall into the category and won't make it and may find up there in the dark place eternally because they don't, they're lawless. This is not accusation. This is Bible diagnosing. This is Bible um, fruit judging not persons this is fruit and all i could think when i got out of there and i've seen this in mega ministry some minor micro ministry i'm very concerned for these certain ones certain kinds and what i saw was matthew 6 matthew 7 22 it says that in the last day when it's too late jesus will say some of these will come up these famous ones two or three famous ones some not famous, but many, some even famous. That's the Lord said. At the last days when it's too late, 
They'll go up to the Lord and say, but Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I lay hands on people and do signs and wonders and cast out devils in your name? Didn't I do all that? And the Lord will say to them, depart from me. Out of you, get away from me. Because you who work lawlessness. What is lawlessness? Ironically, my field. Lawlessness by Strong's Bible Concordance means false authority. Using their authority in a false, incorrect manner that is lawless. To shame people, to manipulate people, to con people, to win their trust, to keep them spellbound, to manipulate for offerings, to withstand, so they avoid you know, self-protection of being confronted. There is a lot of witchcraft, real witchcraft, and rebellion and false doctrine, but also no love in Christian ministry. And that's what I came out of, not knowing that before. And so if I can help you defrag, I'm here online for anyone in the nation by divine appointment on the apps and things. And I'm here in land locally to discuss and defrag your doctrine. Because if it's good teaching, you can have good teaching mixed with false teaching and then no character, poor character. So we're full of joy. I'd rather have two or three under 10 true people, teammates, co-laborers, normal people, than many mega thousands that you can't trust them. You don't know who they are, what kind of weird stuff they're doing. And, you, <laughs> and one thing like Paul, and i got to close. I like Paul as my hero in his Galatians 1, 1, and 2. Paul, an apostle, he's not embarrassed to say it, a training apostle. I love that he says it in lowercase letters, an off-scouring, non-famous, just a servant leader apostle. That's me. Galatians 1, 1, and 2, I, Apostle Paul, not set out by any one person or any one group. That means I'm not going to have divided loyalty. I'm not going to be minimized, diminished, controlled, or used, or bought. And we hope that continues, really. All right. I and the brothers, surely there were mothers and other leaders of all kinds with him. I and the brothers that are with me. Paul says as a red flag to me in a helpful way, hopefully to you. I and the brothers that are with me, co-laborers, not under me. I'm not over them to lord it over, control them. Many of them have been controlled. They don't want that. I and the brothers all on the same team in God's community, Ephesians 4. That's what it translates to me. That's what we are teaching here, community, Ephesians 4, diversity led by the Spirit. That's what I'm doing. That's all I do. That's all I want. Paul, not sent out by anybody, not anybody's captive, not anybody's slave, not anybody's micromanageable you better not say that, Paul. You'll get me in trouble if you say that. So then another positive thing is Paul wouldn't embarrass anybody if he made a big mistake, if he got goofy stuff he said. And I think that's also healthy. So I can go fellowship. They're not to blame or responsible if I did anything goofy or fouled up. You know what I mean? So I think for the future church that, that Galatians 6, 1, Ephesians 4 is huge perhaps huge for the success and the continuation of a non-ornery, non-clubby, non-fault-finding, rejuvenated, inside-out, renewed-as-the-eagle type of ministry, move of God. And that's what we're for. This is Dr. T. Tavo D'Arcy. Even if I mention certain groups that have false teaching that didn't mean I don't respect you and I couldn't get along with you and you know rationally come let us reason together though your sins are as found as scarlet God will wash you white as snow and my sins too any sins we either of us have that we don't know about that we have listen God wants unity Ephesians 4 Philadelphian church the bride of Christ and that is all I'm about God love you God bless you. This is Tavo DRC signing off for now. Bye-bye.